When most people think about water, the furthest that they get is, let's talk about the difference between filtered water, tap water, let's talk about minerals. But this conversation with Veda Austin is going to take your thoughts and understanding of water to an entirely new level. So stay tuned. Welcome back. My name is Sarah. This is the Sarah Kleiner Wellness YouTube channel. Today, I have Veda Austin on the show, and this is part one of a two-part series. We ended up chatting for well over two hours, and I just wanted to divide this up for it to be a little bit more digestible. Very, very cool conversation on water and how it has the ability to store memory and even consciousness. So this, again, as I mentioned in the intro, is far above the conversation that most people have about water, just differentiating between tap water, filtered water, water with minerals. We are taking things to an entirely new level. And I think this conversation, part one and part two, are going to shift the way that you view water and yourself and your body, all the cells in your body and how they also have the ability to hold these things. So I hope you enjoy it. And again, there is a huge slideshow that comes along with this interview. Most of my interviews are, you can just plug them in, listen to them. But I think you'll be really interested to look at some of these slides that Veda talks about. So I hope you enjoy it. Make sure to leave us a like, leave us a comment. If you do enjoy it, share this video out with anyone who you feel could benefit from it. And a quick thank you to two sponsors. You can see in this video, I am wearing blue blockers the entire video because she is in New Zealand. I'm here in the States and we were on completely different time schedules and I really wanted to have her on the show. So Viva Rays is my go-to source for blocking blue light, especially if I have to do something like be on the computer at night, it's less than ideal. I use the Viva Rays and my code there is Yogi to save 15% on those very high quality circadian glasses to help you protect your circadian rhythms. The second sponsor of today's episode is going to be Optimal Carnivore. I'm really excited about this new supplement. It's Bone and Joint Restore. Something that's different about this. So it is really, really helpful to help you restore cartilage bone, give you that strength within your body. They don't add any extra liver to it, which is kind of a qualm that I have with a lot of the organ meat supplements is they just put liver into everything. They have a separate liver supplement if that's something that you want but you can have too much of a good thing. You can have too much liver. So that's really a wonderful thing about these optimal carnivores. You're going to check out the link in the show notes. That's going to send you to the landing page to give you some special bundle deals and discounts for my followers only. So thank you to optimal carnivore for sponsoring today's show. Let's go ahead and jump right into it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. I am so excited for today's guest. We're obviously in different time zones. <laughs> She's reporting to us uh, from the future. Um, Veda, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm. I'm so excited. I just, um, I just made you host so that you can share some some things with my audience. Now there will this will be audio only for some people, um, but it will also be on YouTube. So I have audiences in both places. So if you're on audio and you want to look at some of these things that she's going to share, then you'll want to go to the YouTube link to watch. But before we dive into any of that, let's just talk a little bit about you and how you got into the work that you do, which is so fascinating. Sure. Well, there's a long version and a short version, but <laughs> I'll try to make it the shorter version. So essentially, I'm a water researcher and crystallographer. So my area of specialty is in crystallography, which is just really a fancy way of saying that I photograph water in a certain stage of its um, of ice. So uh, before water is completely frozen and just after it's kind of gone from liquid and starting to turn to ice. So there's a sweet spot in between those two that I call a stage of creation where I've identified with over 40,000 photos that water is able to absorb uh, conscious expression and its environment, and then design uh, in a very complex and intelligent manner um, with its building blocks of ice in the form of imagery and pictures um, at this particular stage I'm talking about of the freezing. So that's really 
what I'm seeing. So I'm seeing this work macroscopically. So it, I can see it with my naked eye and I take all of my photos on my iPhone. I teach, I've taught thousands of people now how to do this work. So we can now safely say that this is not random. Um, and I've discovered that water can communicate, if you will, uh, from a threefold perspective and in three ways. So the threefold perspective is through science art and consciousness or you might prefer intuition or spirituality but also i've identified that water communicates in three ways whereby it can design something called signature patterns which i will share with you in a second it means that different types of water have their own pattern and you can identify them it means that water can design through artistic expression which most people know me for uh, i always say that art is the heart of water and uh, for many years I worked as a professional oil painter so to be able to kind of say that I see the world through an artistic lens would be an understatement and just to throw in our eye lens is 99% water we literally see everything through the lens of water and then there is something called hydroglyphs which has been getting more scientific interest because of the repeatability so essentially a hydroglyph is a symbol in ice that has various layers of meaning uh, to say I have one means that I have to have seen the same symbol appear using the same word influence a word influence is where I write a word put my petri dish of water on top of it for 30 seconds remove it and freeze it using my short-term method of crystallography and then photograph it so if I write a word it might seem weird but you know water is not reading words but it's absorbing the energy of words and then freezing into the energy of a word. And that energy of a word is a symbol. And so that's very interesting. So to say I have one, I need to have seen that appear at least 50 times and it takes a long time. So I have just coming up to 30 hydroglyphs and it's taken me five years to identify them all. And I have a small team around the world working alongside me to discover the layers of meaning. When you see, say, for example, 64 of these symbols all in one go, which is what I shared at the last um, annual water conference in Germany with Dr. Jerry Pollack, it's, uh, it's quite remarkable, really, because then you have to kind of think, well, this isn't random. And, and then what does it mean? And, and really, what have we been missing all this time? Yeah, it's so many people are still, they don't even understand the fact that our bodies are 99% water molecule. And this is just, you know, you said the eye, right? We, we view this through a lens of water, but I think that people are just so stuck on, you know, you drink a certain amount of water per day and, you know, that's how your body stays hydrated. And maybe some people have even heard of the work of Emoto, right? But this is kind of taking that sort of work maybe to the next level, would you say? I think that um, over time, there are pioneers who open the doorway for new things to become more and more appreciated. And I think Emoto really opened the door for people to see themselves as bodies of water sensitive to words and environment and thoughts. My work is much more simple to do because I do it in my kitchen. I use it in my regular freezer. You know, I'm, there's nothing complicated or expensive about what I use. I'm not in a cold room. So Emoto really, um, he was not embraced by the scientific community, mm -hmm. the widest scientific community, but it doesn't lessen the significance of what he did for people. Um, what he did really was was to help us see that that we are bodies of water and like you rightly said you know by molecular count we're 99 percent water there are trillions of water molecules in our bodies and if you consider that there are more water molecules in your body in each and every one of our bodies than stars in the milky way it is remarkable to think about that one of the reasons we don't think about ourselves as fluid is because when we look in the mirror with our fourth phase water eyes, we see the solid body. But, you know, we're only ever a cut away from leaking or an emotion away from leaking or a toilet break away from leaking or an exercise away from leaking or various other things away from leaking. And yet we tend to think we're so solid. 
So we're taught so much that we're so carbon, but we're not really taught about water, this aspect of water, um, and how 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 huge a role it plays in what it is to be a living being, let alone a human, but a living right. being. Um, and you're right, people tend to think about how much water should they drink or, you know, water washes away our waste and these kinds of things. But in the old days, um, in ancient times, water wasn't even called water. They called it the waters because they, it was considered to be a living body of water. And then when plumbing came into being, when the Romans came and invented plumbing, and people visually started to see that water could take away their waste and 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 kind of do things other than sacred activities, so to speak. Water became water, you know, rather mm -hmm. it went from waters to water. And now so often we'll call it H2O. But the, the area where the waters or waters has remained is when people say her waters broke, the sacred waters mm -hmm. broke. So, you know, it's been a kind of um, a, a quite a, a, a fast track um, that we've taken away from this concept of water being extremely special and sacred. Um, although many indigenous cultures, and I know that many conscious people do hold it to be sacred, but many, many people still think that all water is the same and it, it mm -hmm. doesn't really matter what kind of water you drink at all and again that's a first world problem the fact that we can even think about what kind mm. of water we can drink rather than what water can we drink right yeah it's it's funny the more that you know my audience knows I kind of got into the alternative space through nutrition and you know then it just got a little strange and now I just love learning about water and whenever I talk about water over on Instagram I will get, you know, I'll get people who just think it's ridiculous. You know, they're like, oh, this is, I, I get the, um, the messages from people, snake oil. <laughs> yeah. That was actually what, what prompted me to reach out to you is this, this woman was in my Instagram messages and said, um, I'm a chemist and I just want you to know, um, you might be right about the water inside the body, but you're not right about our ability to influence, um, any sort of bulk water. That's just complete snake oil. And that was the day that I reached out to you. I was like, you know what? I need to bring <laughs> Veda Austin <laughs> onto my podcast because the fact that she thinks she's like, so, and it wasn't just against her, you know, I think that there's a many, many, if not most people still think that it is some sort of woo-woo, um, like I said, snake oil. And when, I, when anyone says snake oil, period, I just, I'm like, okay, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to do know, that. But I, I can appreciate people's views. You know, it's like, I, I've, I've chosen this path out of the mode of my own curiosity. I always mm -hmm. say, if, you know, rather than just throw something out, why don't you try it yourself? Yes. See what happens. And, and that's how my work began. You know, I didn't know if water really had memory or, or could store information. And I had limited resources as to figure out if it really did at all. So I just started doing some research. And I, and I found three people that inspired me to begin this work. And this work has been, I've been working for 10 years now um, doing this daily I'm wow. prolific that's how I have you know just about 40,000 photos and wow. so I don't think that the these the amount of photos I have and the research I've done can be ignored I think that when you have that much work such a big body of work and so many pictures to share and teaching people and they are seeing results I think from that perspective it becomes very difficult to just ignore it Mm -hmm. And um, I'm teaching I'm teaching people to not just see it only from a scientific perspective, because water, in the way in which it seems to just be, we have to remember that it's wild. You know, it's not a it's not a photocopier. It's not just there to do whatever we we will it to. You know, it's not going to. It's it's actually surprisingly sensitive to your intention mm, and so yes I, I'd kind of like to like 
take us on a little journey so that you can see how I began this. So for the people that are just like, oh, here we go again, <laughs> which I have to say this, you know, I, I, I know that my work might appear fringe and I'm, you know, that's okay. We, we have to, we have to, to feel, we feel how we feel. Right. But Dr. Gerald Pollack, who is the world's leading water scientist right now, he even still gets told he's his work is snake oil and rubbish. oh that's I had him on my podcast and I was told that it was snake oil and he was incorrect and I'm like <laughs> yeah and, yeah. and but you're always going to find you never can you make anybody happy and I think that it's just about finding your own way and your own investigations but you know I I I was nervous because when he invited me I I'm pretty fringe and mm -hmm. so um you know, I was the very last speaker at the event. I was the keynote speaker at the banquet. So I wasn't there with all the scientists and physicists and stuff. He put me in a very specific place so I could be the the happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so what was great was that I, I got to share all my work. And at the end, I, I, and I, I shared the story. And at the very end, after I'd shared all the hydroglyphs and, you know, the repeatability and whatnot, but the whole story, one scientist got up and he said, you know, when you started, I thought, oh, here we go. Here's another emoto. <laughs> and, and, and then he said, and then I was listening and then I was seeing your work, showing the other, other people's work. And I thought, well, maybe she's just cherry picking, picking the best pictures, you know, and this and this and this. And, uh, and then I went on and I started to talk about hydroglyphs and I started to give 64 examples of each one and then by the end of it he said to me you know and this is publicly he he kind of announced that this is really really something this is remarkable wow. and it was quite um humbling to see what so many people see which is oh this kind of oh here we go you know it's another this and it's another that um but but that's to be expected that's the scientific way um so 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 I kind of was like well I have to be ready for anything um but I really I always say you know I, I'm a researcher I'm not a scientist I'm an artist at heart and so what Jerry Pollock when he you know wrote a little review about my book he said what what the the amazing images that water that of water that 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 um Vader displays is, is truly remarkable it is now up to the science world to figure out how it's working Mm. And I'm now actually working with a quantum physicist who, and we're writing a paper on my work and how it's working and he can explain it beautifully. So I'm very excited about that because I think once we've got that paper published, which we've been offered already to have it published in a journal, then, you know, um, that can at least, even for the, the few people that, that, that want something to reference in this field, there'll be something there. And so I'm excited about that. Yeah, that's so, very exciting. Well, it is, especially if you are clever enough to understand anything about quantum physics, of which <laughs> you know this guy Dave is trying to explain to me. And I think that that's very different than than looking just at chemistry. Oh, totally. And, it's a hundred percent different. That's my friend yeah. Carrie Bennett, who did, uh, I guess, a presentation with you at a, a conference. She and I have a, a course called Quantum Fertility, and we help women on this basis of quantum physics and quantum biology understand how they can influence their fertility um, through quantum physics, essentially. And when we look at our body in this chemical model, we've extracted the water, you know, and so it's not really an accurate picture of what's going on in the body. So I, I, I love that you're, you know, marrying the two of your work in, in quantum physics. It's so, so wonderful. I actually think it had to go on a yeah. quantum physics level because for this work, work to be really taken a, a step further that it needs to go, I think that's the only direction it can go mm. because if we keep going back to the work of Emoto or the work of some other people talking about water and this idea of memory, I think we might be missing something. Mm -hmm. I think there's much more to this and more depth to this and that actually uh, water could well be so much more than we've ever, ever given it um, even any mind to. You know, it's quite interesting because we are so much water 
And if you mm -hmm. pardon the pun, you boil it down, you know, where water, salts, minerals, and consciousness. And you look at water, and we tend to think of liquid water, but obviously we know that water can be a liquid, solid gas and a type of plasma or gel. Mm -hmm. And there's subtleties in each one of those. There are over 300 different types of ice. And there's so much we don't know still about all those different types of ice. And because water is anomalous, it doesn't make sense. You know, it defies the laws of physics and gravity because it expands when it cools and it goes up trees. It does all these weird things, right? And science can't even tell us 100%. They cannot agree where water actually came from originally. Mm -hmm. Some think it came from asteroids and meteorites. Some think it came from the primary water source in the held within the ringwoodite inside the earth's mantle which came up through earthquakes and fishes and various things so either way it's kind of this alien um substance of which we can't live without so what do we really know about water therefore what do we really know about ourselves and our own potential and we love to say that water is dead we say we, we mm -hmm. say oh that's dead water or that's living water mm -hmm. and we've labeled it but yes. water does not die that's a lie water is always in one of its stages and so it's it will evaporate so mm -hmm. the polluted water for example will evaporate and it will reincarnate for us all to see yes and oh, so same thing we're made of salt right you put salt into water and if the water evaporates you'll see that the salts are still there even when someone is cremated the mm -hmm. ash of the salts so it's very interesting. And then consciousness, I mean, no one can really even kind of tell us about consciousness in a way in which we really truly comprehend and understand. And so we're made of these immortal substances, essentially, these kind of shapeshifters. And, and, and what we know about water is so little, it's just mm -hmm. a drop in oh, the ocean. I, yeah. <laughs> so the potential in that it's huge, you know, it's so huge. So um, I, I think that water, and like Jerry Pollack says too, you know, water, and particularly he's talking about fourth phase water, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. has unique properties, but he thinks that, that that easy water exclusion zone water, fourth phase water, could be the medicine of the future. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm of the mindset that um, I'm already seeing some of that happen. Yeah. Um, and some of the work that um, I've been doing, whereby people are freezing ice and into this crystallographic stage and then eating the ice. This was taught to me by my children. Uh -huh. And in the eating of the ice, which holds the energy of the last word, um, there is a, a great deal of, of healing that we've seen. For example, if somebody... Um, has insomnia and they might work, write the word rest and then water will absorb the energy of the word rest crystallizes into form eating the ice and and you keep doing that for about 10 days and I've had several people come back and say actually yes you know I'm sleeping better it's helped with people with diarrhea it's helped headaches it's this one lady I'm going live on Instagram tomorrow with her um Rachel and she had a oh, I know Rachel right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so um you know she's going to be sharing her journey um is she the one that got rid of her, her Hashimoto's uh Rachel Tudor I think I think so yeah well I know that she had about seven things going on and so she started eating the ice every day and I think she's been doing it nearly nine months now and she has a complete clean bell of health. And I think it's not just about eating the ice, but I think mm -hmm. it's about the journey water takes you on when you start implementing it in a sacred manner in your life. So uh, funny story though, the, the one of the reasons I actually even knew about this was my children have been watching me do this crystallography for years and my daughter Shanti who's like oh my god she's I don't know she's 12 going on 112 and <laughs> she um was watching me hold up the petri dish I'd just taken a photo of some very pretty crystallography and she said can I have that mum and I gave her the dish 
and she started to eat the ice and I'm like what are you doing and she said well it's good for me mom and then my son did it and then over the period of time I've worked with other parents and they say you know my children are eating the ice and wow. I'm like that's interesting so my husband he thought he wanted going to do a study on plant medicines using words and my technique so for a week he'd focus on one particular type of plant medicine so for one week he was writing the word ayahuasca um putting the petri dish on top of the word and doing the process and then he would eat the ice afterwards and after the end of that week he came to me rather privately and said I think I need to take this a little more seriously because he started to get some experiences that he wasn't expecting in relation wow. to that plant medicine so I knew it was potent but I, I really, I, and it's so new, like this is just, this is just what all we're seeing is a drop of potential right now. Um, and, and so few people really know about it. And I think it's very powerful because it's in the liquid crystal stage, which mm -hmm. is the four phase stage too, because the freezing method is only about five minutes in, you know, to the freezing. So it, it takes, it's very quick. So you have a separation of liquid water and ice underneath. And it's the ice underneath that you're eating that is really holding that information. And I used to wonder, you know, and, and, and this, my quantum physics guy taught me this. He used to say, you know, the stage where I freeze water is between molecular chaos and molecular order or uh, sort of in a state of suspension. And I said, molecular chaos is because water updates its information every trillionth, trillionth of a second. So I used to think, how can water even notice me then? Like, it, I'd be a bleep on its radar if it's moving that fast. Like, I didn't understand that. And so he said, well, yes, Vita, you know, there is a very big difference between molecular chaos and molecular excitement. He said, what you're doing with your biofield and all the rest of it, he said that you are creating excited water and excited water is excited about something that it has a focus about. And that was very interesting to me. So if you'd like, we can kind of just start on a bit of a visual journey, perhaps, and I can talk yeah. through what I've seen. And I, I think we start with the, the people who inspired me. So um, I kind of will just talk through it as we kind of go now. I do like this quote by Rudolf Steiner. He says, the human being thinks that he creates intelligence, um, whereas where he only draws intelligence from the universal sea of intelligence, which I, I think is quite interesting. Mm, very. Okay. So we know Emoto's work. So one of the things about Emoto's work is it was very much in contrast. So uh, people seem to love to see things in contrast. They, they love do. to see the best mm -hmm. and the worst of things. But I don't know that that's real life all the time. And, and, and I quite like all the stuff in between. And that my research has gone quite, quite in that direction. Um, this man's work is spectacular. His name is Laurent Costa. He's a French microscopic photographer and he takes photographs of water using very similar method to Masaru Emoto whereby he flash freezes the water except that he does not think that he is experimenting on water and he is in the same ethos and mindset as me because he sees water as a spiritual teacher so he would invite water to share whatever it wanted and he would do his best to remain the observer but sometimes he'd smile at the water before he'd flash freeze it and he would get smiley faces smiling back at him, as you can <laughs> see here. Uh, he's written a book called Journey into the Heart of Water. And as you can see this beautiful heart there. And, and seeing pictures is quite different than seeing geometries. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like we've all seen snowflake images and these kinds of things. But to see a picture smiling back at you or an image, it's, it's very different. Um, this man inspired me a lot. His name is Thomas Hieronymus. And he was a radionic engineer. And he made a very interesting discovery that when he went into a Parisian meat market on a 
very cold day, he noticed that the freshly placed organs of an animal appeared to be affecting the way the frost froze on the glass behind where they were placed. For example, the frost would freeze into the shape of a liver organ above a liver organ. And his hypothesis was that there seemed to be some kind of life force energy still emanating out of the organs. And he put that down to being water in the blood. And each organ has a type of um, sonic signature, which is vaguely like a cymatic imprint that holds the blueprint shape form and function of the organ and the water within that blood because it was still fresh still had some emanation and was sharing information with the water in the air because the water in the air was so cold it took form and shape um, when it hit the glass. So I found that very interesting because he saw that with his naked eye. And I realized that the secret was in the freezing where the unseen becomes seen. And I thought, well, I have a Petri dish. I have my imagination. I have had a healing experience with some spring water here in New Zealand. And I'm going to see for myself if water actually has any kind of memory at all. And maybe I won't, and maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but I didn't have an attachment to the outcome. So I got a my petri dish, put some water in it, and it was spring water, but I've used all kinds of waters. Mm. And I noticed a bit of fluff floating around in there. So I put my hand in to take up the fluff consciously thinking I wonder if my hand will have any impact on the water water's memory so the first picture that I ever took was of water that I had completely frozen solid I didn't know any different or any better but it despite that you can still see that this mm -hmm. incredible hand has formed and it took up half of the dish my dishes are about the size of my hand and so if you imagine half that size, that's actually pretty huge macroscopically. And so then I thought, well, if any water is going to be naturally informed, then perhaps it would be seawater. So I got some seawater and I froze some of that and I got this fish. And I had actually thought prior to freezing this, if I see anything related to the ocean, you know, then, then you know, that, that, that might mean this is something really important. So you can see the fish, the fins, the eye, and the gills and the, the tail. And I mean, this is completely frozen solid. It's very interesting. And, and seawater freezes differently than mm. fresh water. Um, because you go, okay, well, yeah, still might be random, might be random, but mm, maybe not. So over the over the course of a year, I started seeing more and more and more images. And then I became more familiar with the new science of water. And that new science of water includes the understanding of fourth phase water or exclusion zone water. And Dr. Jerry Pollack was talking about how you can find this water in the in-between phases. So the stage between liquid and ice and the stage between ice and liquid, the basically the, the freezing and the melting stages. So I started to open my freezer earlier and earlier to see if I could see when the water began to freeze and so after opening it earlier and earlier I noticed there was liquid on top and ice underneath at around five minutes actually it was around four minutes because my freezer was much colder I had a different freezer then it was set at minus 20 I think at 23 or 24 degrees celsius and so after four minutes I, I noticed this thing happening so I took the dish out drained the liquid water and saw this incredible crystallography it allowed light to come through which is why you see different colors coming through from the backgrounds of my work it had a much more three-dimensional look and the imagery was exceptionally clear and this picture on the right here um, was 100 percent taken by my son rama he is part indian and he named he was named after lord rama who is known to have uh, a bow and arrow and he was trying to con me into getting him a bow and arrow and we were talking about this and so he decided he would project the thought of an arrow into the water so this is from a thought and he um and so he froze it using my technique he took this photo and i i think perhaps his photography is better than mine um and you can clearly see the difference though in technique so the technique is really simple um, you're wanting to have liquid on top with ice underneath 
and you tip the liquid away. And this is sort of how it should look in the freezer. So you can see, okay, I see crystallography, but actually this is all liquid here, which is still, you can move. So this is the what's happening in the freezer. Okay, I'm going to stop it here. This is the stage I would take the water out with my new technique that I teach people. You can see there's a lot of clarity. A very clever person managed to figure out how to put a camera in the freezer and froze it from beginning to end. Wow. And so we were able to observe that water freezes in three ways. It has a first freeze, which is this. The second freeze, which is sort of about a centimeter above the first freeze. And then there is the liquid water in between, and then that freezes. So the liquid water in between that freezes last has the most of the um, kind of minerals in the deposits, like that, that actually cloud the ice. So what we're going to see is a washing over of this. That's the second freeze. And then there is, from the top to the bottom, there's a dark bubbly thing that comes down. That's the third freeze. That is the water in between the two um, layers of ice. So we're going to basically see it begin to cloud over. And you can see the significance of why I take the water out when I do. So you can see that the washing and the clouding kind of help happen almost simultaneously in this freezer. And then um, eventually it all kind of comes to an end and there's a crack at the end. So you can see that now this image is very dull when you compare it to, for example, whoop, not to that, to this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from there to, goodness me, we are going so far ahead here that I don't even know how I managed to do that. <laughs> You're getting a little insight into all the gems you're going to see. So, okay. So we saw that. So facial recognition. So I always used to think like, well, water seems to love to design images and patterns. And just so people know, Dr. Jerry Pollack gave me some great advice a while ago, years ago, because he knew about this before many other people did. Wow. And um, he said, why don't you do a, a survey um, a questionnaire online and have 25 of your photos and basically write what does this look like to you and circulate it and then that would be kind of a good way of seeing image recognition without prompting so I circulated it through people I knew so people didn't know what they were looking at they was they didn't know anything about this project and they didn't know it came from me and 290 something people did the survey and eight, just over 85% of people could recognize the ice image for what the influence was prior to freezing. And out of three of those images, 100% of people could recognize the image for what it was prior to freezing. So essentially, if we look at this, water is designing at the age of a teenager. So this is, and it's in a gifted one. So this is very, very interesting. So my very first face, I call <laughs> my friend Wendy is known as the face of water now. So this is my friend Wendy. I put my dish of water on top of her face for 30 seconds, removed, used my technique, and you can see her face. Of course, well, maybe that's random. Um, but, but then you see it do lots of other people's faces. And I'm interested in various different ancient and classical studies. So I've used a picture of Jupiter, also known as Zeus, I've, and a Roman coin down at the bottom left and various different um, images here. And it's very interesting when you start to see how water designs their faces. And you can see I overfroze this a little bit. Um, because it's a process of getting to learn my technique. Even for me, different waters freeze at different times, and sometimes water just does random things. So you can still see the image. So these are just a handful of examples of my work, um, and we can go through. each. Every single one has a story, which would take us a long time to kind of go through. But I do like this little one, because yeah. somebody who was pregnant drank some water um, and left me some to freeze and she was thinking of her little baby and oh. you can see that that shines through and what's interesting is that out of all the others it's quite different because it has this light around where the spine yeah. and that light I think is extremely well for me anyway in my interpretation it is extremely relevant to the spinal fluid 
And um, I interviewed Dr. Mauro Zapatera, who is a Harvard doctor, who's literally saying that the spinal fluid is the portal to cosmic consciousness. And he explains why. And he is amazing. I highly recommend you look him up wow. if you don't know yeah. of him or his work. Um, and this is a very interesting one. Um, and the more you see it, and I've and repeated it too, and, and, and it's amazing when you see things when they repeat, uh, I, I simply asked the water if it knew my name. And what's interesting is that this is how I write my initials. This was not part of any of it. This is just for your reference. I just, it, the water just designed it in exactly the way that I write my initials. Wow. Batman is there because my children have been doing this with me for years. And my son would literally have his Petri dish of water beside him on the, on the couch, watching a show and then freeze it. What's very interesting about this one here, you might see the pig's face here. Um, the There was a YouTube video. I don't know why someone sent this to me, um, but anyway, I was sent it and the dish of water was sitting beside me as I was watching it. And it was of this sow, this pig who literally jumped out of a truck. They, they were being taken to the meat works and she, she jumped out of the, the truck and um, and so it, it, gratefully someone found her. She's fine. But this was interesting because water is showing us something very important here. Not only did it pick her up, like pick the image of the pig up, but if you look here, there is another pig. Here is the mouth and all of this and there's the ear. So it suggests that even though on the video we couldn't see any other pigs, there was likely another pig that was wanting to jump out with her. So mm -hmm. it, it's extremely interesting. And then we continue on and we kind of continue on and there are really thousands and thousands and each one again has a story. This was an interesting one because I had put the um, water on top of a wedding invitation and what's interesting is that the wedding invitation didn't have any rings on it. It just, the main word was wedding and the water designed this rather remarkable ring. Um, and then you go over here and you look at the thumb, which I recently posted. I saw that on Instagram, yeah. Yeah, well, you might notice that there's a chip in the nail. And um, a few hours after I did that, I actually chipped my thumbnail in exactly wow. that same place as you can see in the image, which is also rather remarkable. Um, and then, you know, you, we continue on and we continue on. And here's another very interesting one. So my influence um, was a bread knife. I, it was just handy and I just put it on. I'm like, oh, well, let's see what happens. Um, but what I wasn't intending was to see the coasters that were just on the bench top. Well, they've been picked up here as well as the knife. And I think that's interesting because water is showing us that it's very aware of its environment. And this is a particularly interesting one. So this, I, I mean, I mentioned that I um, was an artist. And so I, I, I like to paint birds and things. And so I was looking at this artist's picture. And so what I did was stare at her picture for um, a minute and then close my eyes and hold that picture in my mind's eye. And then I turned and I looked at the Petri dish of water for a, for a, about a minute. And then I froze it. And so the water froze into this incredible like image here, which is very reminiscent of this one. Um, so, so this is all extremely interesting. But like, then what does it mean? So I think it's important. Okay, we can see imagery is there, but then like other people can do this. Absolutely. So a lot of these are also by children. Children seem to have the knack of this because they mm -hmm. don't let their how does this work brain get in the way. And so um, not all of them are from children. This is from actually um, uh, Laura, who um, was working at the Pollock lab, actually, and you can see the apple. This was a boy who really was interested in tarantulas, and this was his influence. Another boy from school who's interested was um, in, they were doing a study on big cats, so he chose lions and used that picture. My daughter did this one because she loves unicorns. Wow. This is from um, the water that came from 
uh, so uh, I think it was a little girl who had a mouse as a pet and the mouse had some drinking water. She used some of the water and froze this. Now over here, you'd be, why the heck is somebody going to like um, use nail clippers? But it wasn't intentional. It was, they were sitting next to the Petri dish that wasn't part of the whole thing at all. And then, you know, again, we have a, a lot of different um, ones here. And so I, I don't think we can overlook light. And I'm kind of going through this because it takes me hours to really get deep into all of this work. Mm -hmm. What does it mean? Why is it happening? What is the significance? But I don't want us to overlook the significance of light mm. because water absorbs photons so yes. much. So it has a light source, which we don't often really think about, right? And so... I was speaking to an indigenous woman once and she said that she could speak to bees and she she said that she would watch their hives for long periods of time and one day a bee communicated to her and said we don't mind you watching our hive but please don't look at it for so long because your conscious expression is putting too much light in the hive and we like it to be darker and I thought Oh, right. So where we put our conscious expression is also where we put our light. Now, then that, that brings up to what are we looking at here? Well, every now and then when I get the, the timing just perfect, I'm able to see as water is just beginning to freeze. Not always, but often it will, will start to free, freeze from the side of the dish in. And you'll see this light source emanating around each of the sort of spheres, if you will. I think it's light that paves the way for the design of this work. And I think that that's a very, very interesting piece. Um, as I mentioned, water communicates in three ways. We have a signature pattern. So this is the signature pattern of municipal tap water. You can see it's quite disordered. Rainwater looks like a fan. Spring water looks like um, what I call star hexagons or fern hexagons. It's like a star with ferns coming off each leg in the shape of a hexagon and filtered water tends to look like a filter. Then there's the art. And then there are hydroglyphs, which we can you'll see more of them soon, but this is just a, a small collection of some of them. Um, now, this is probably one of the most important things of my work because I think it's talking about what we're seeing, right? Mm -hmm. what, what is it? So. When we use tap water, which looks much like this municipal tap water tends to look quite disordered. And tap water has taught me so much. And tap water is, you might be surprised, one of the most responsive waters. That might seem shocking because, oh, it's got the chemicals, it's got the heavy mm -hmm. metals, it's got all of this action going on, right? Well, if we don't, I, we, when you're looking at water, well, not you specifically, but the general people, everybody, <laughs> We tend to look at what water holds. You know, if we mm -hmm. read an analysis, what we do is we go, okay, it's got, it's got, um, you know, this amount of TDS and sulfides and sulfates and blah blah and this and that and the other thing, or whatever it's, it is in there. Yeah. Um, but what do we actually know about the water? Not just about like what it holds, but that's only telling us about what the water holds. Right. What do we know about the water? so if tap water here and then you can and then I let that melt and then I use the same exact tap water after melting it held it to my heart for one minute and refroze it mm. you can see it's begun to take all these shapes of ferns which it started to structurally improve but it hasn't changed chemically so I'm not talking about any of the stuff trying to get people to drink tap water that's not right. what I'm about I'm using tap water to show us and teach us more about water mm. so what we're seeing is that not a chemical change but a structural change so if it's changing structurally so significantly then then what is it and and one of the things I would like to suggest is that I think we are seeing water's energetic state of health my dad is Maori so we so in New Zealand, you know, there is the indigenous people, the, the Maori people, and um, we have uh, this word, right, for um, 
with spirit, which is wairua, and then two waters, the physical and the spiritual waters. Well, there's another important word. I'm just putting that into the ether for now. Another important word is mori, and the mori is the life force energy of a of any natural thing. And the more life force energy it has, the more mana or the more presence or spiritual presence it can hold. So what's interesting is that we're seeing this um, huge change in the structure. So we're seeing the life force energy of water improved by the fact that we are offering it some kind of connection. So tap water is probably the most respect re responsive because it is the most desperate for attention. Wow. One we ignore the most, the one we give the worst rap. Oh, you don't want to have anything to do with that. I mean, obviously this is a first world problem. Yeah. If we respected and thought about water, like people that have to walk for miles to get it, we might think about it in a different way. Um, but yeah. What I see is, is that tap water is much like someone who is unwell, who's sick. If somebody comes and gives that person some food or cares for them in some way, the sick person is going to feel cared for and there will be an emotional upliftment. And this is what an emotional upliftment looks like in, in the world of water. And again, by molecular count, we're 99% water. And anyone in the natural healing arena will say that the best place to begin to heal is with an attitude of gratitude. So I think that this is significant. And I think that this is important because perhaps, you know, <laughs> perhaps water has a lot more to do with our emotions than we've ever thought. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, in our deepest sorrow, one of the most amazing things is that our body creates its own medicine. So we'll cry in our deepest sorrow usually. But our face is designed so that our that the tears will roll from our eyes around our cheeks back and towards our mouth because the tears have been restructured and reordered to actually help heal our hearts. And and I think that that's very interesting. So this is, again, more municipal tap water after love and gratitude has been projected to it. I think this is really quite remarkable. Then yeah. you can see, again, you know, when you when tap water is used, and I hate the word control, because much like um, uh, Laurent Costa, I don't like the idea of experimenting on water because it suggests that um, water is not an active participant, whereas I see that actually it, it is, mm. um, which might be way too much for more for many people. But if you look at it from my perspective, coming from perhaps a more indigenous view, where um, New Zealand was the first country in the entire world to make give a river the rights of personhood based really? on of, yeah, based on the, the Maori tribe of the Whanganui River, who fought very, very hard um, to have that um, river um, given this personhood so that they could take care of it, because they saw that its belly was being scraped um, with all of the, um, the, the uh, pebbles and things being taken out of it, and the... Um, the mouth was getting full of effluence and the headwaters were being diverted. And to them, that's aquatic decapitation and the head is the most sacred part of the body. And it's interesting because they consider the water to be um, their ancestor, hold their ancestors. And so if they're not looking after the water, they're not looking after the whole. And I, and I think that's very interesting. So um, urine is a great, you can use this technique using urine and you can see the difference between someone high dehydrated and then someone who's become more hydrated and the urine from a stressed person and urine after someone has been meditating for an hour. And I think that that is very helpful to see because the fluids that come out of us have been mm -hmm. through us and they have very intimately picked up on what we've been thinking and doing. Wow. So, you know, what happens if I'm frustrated when I do this crystallography? Well, the water thickens and, and becomes darker. 
and it, it, do, it does it just won't design with me in that frequency so there are times where water won't do anything it won't mm -hmm. play with me and the times where I've had a long long day and I've just been on the motorway stuck in traffic kids are going are we there yet are we there and <laughs> And then, um, and then, you know, I, maybe, maybe I promised someone I'd do some crystallography and I, and I go to do it, but I realize that in that mindset, it won't play with me. It, it just doesn't. And it's not out of judgment. It's simply because water doesn't resonate at that frequency, which is wow. interesting, but then sadness is a whole nother story. So water often reflects my sad face back to it. Wow. Me. Um, it, it's not that it's deforming or degrading because I'm sad. It's simply observing. And I actually think that the more spiritual aspect of water is the observer or the witness, not judging. And if you look at it from that word, why do I, that spiritual and physical waters, that's where I've kind of gone much further into this concepts of how does consciousness or how does spirit and water connect? What's the peace there? Because, you know, um, you always hear about spirit, soul, subtle body leaving the body, but nobody can ever explain how, mm -hmm. even what, what anything more than that. But I think water might be a, a way in which we can get some answers about that because, um, well, I don't know if you want me to share about this, 5G stuff. Yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, well, I, I kind of just thought it was quite interesting. So over here is spring water. Um, this is after I put it right beside a 5G tower for 15 minutes. Wow. Um, and this is all the same water. So I would melt it and refreeze it, melt it and refreeze it. But it's quite interesting how quickly it came back to life. Hmm. And that's not because I was giving it lots of love or doing anything specific. It actually just kind of came back to life after a period of time. It wasn't constantly exposed though, but it, it's quite interesting. It's resilience. And, and I actually think it's encouraging that the water has the ability to recover yes. and kind of remember its original blueprint structures. Um, so this is special like like i've talked about this this physical mm -hmm. and spiritual waters the active participant and the observer so i think of spring water like it has both and so do we like we know that we know that um we are active and we are participating in the world and we are also spiritual beings so yes. we have a, a life force energy and we can imagine and we can remember right so we hold memories and we participate in the world. And I see spring water is doing very much that. Whereas distilled water, um, it has a signature pattern, if you will, but I've found that it doesn't design complex imagery because I think it's more as of an observer rather than an active participant because I think salts are what make and help water to store those memories. Um, it's quite interesting because salt is such an important piece in the equation, the salts and minerals and natural waters, of which so many um, um, filtered waters take take everything out. And mm -hmm. so you have to then remineralize and do this whole thing. But water has a very deep relationship with those minerals that it that it naturally kind of um, um, absorbs as it's flowing. And that's re relative to its pH as well. So um, my mum, who was really an angel, she she died of eventually of bone cancer in um, 2000, um, um, sorry, in, in 1999. And I used to live in Japan. And mum and I would write letters to each other. And at the end of every letter, my mums would always make some attempt at drawing a circle and they're always awful. And then she'd do a little heart in the middle. And um, I have a bunch of letters and with her little, you know, sort of um, picture signature, I guess. And so I asked Water, you know, can you connect to my mum? And I was not sure what I would get, but I got this misshapen circle with a heart in the middle. Wow. And then 
a year or so later, I, I asked the same question and I got the same response. This is me and mum. This one was from someone who I'd asked uh, the water to connect to his dad. Uh, this one was when I was thinking about my mother's ancestors who um, apparently had had been called witches because they were midwives and had been burnt at the stake. Goodness. Uh, and so to see her there kind of meant something to me. And then someone asked me, was super worried about their cat, you know, how some people's pets are their babies. And mm -hmm. so the cat passed and she was really really worried that the cat couldn't see her. it's like can the cat see me is the cat okay and uh, I just asked the water is so and so's cat okay and you can see the back of the head kind of looking looking down over there and I thought that that you know was was very interesting mm -hmm. and this is of course it's interesting for people comforting for some people too much for some people and I always suggest you know for those that just find this just too much see it as art at least yeah. you don't throw the baby out with the bath water if you see that this is organic art that has been designed by water then you get to ask you know what does that image mean to me so then it, it, it still has some value um so as you may know I was in this car accident oh my goodness um years ago and this is what got me onto my journey with water originally um so we went under a seven ton truck, rolled twice and the driver died instantly. Sadly, he was decapitated. It was one of the worst accidents in New Zealand where someone survived and that was me. And um, I was the passenger and over the course of just under 20 years, I, I had eight surgeries and most of them were for bowel surgery because the seatbelt had crushed my stomach and into oh. organs and um, the others were fourth four stage four endometriosis. Wow. And so three doctors had told me that I would never be able to have children based on the scar tissue and all the damage. And so <laughs> I had a child for every doctor that told me I couldn't. And one of the reasons that I have this little guy down there, his name's Rama, it was a few years ago now, but um I was telling the story about this car accident to somebody who had come down from Auckland back when I was living in Christchurch long, long ago. And um, my son, Rama, at the time, he was only three years old or just about three. And you know what children do? They, they kind of spy on their parents, especially. Mm -hmm. if they're the and um, he was listening behind. I couldn't see him listening and he heard about the car accident. I went into some detail actually. And he really didn't know about it because I didn't talk to him about it prior to that. And then when I'd finished talking, Rama, he, he, he ran over to me and he jumped up on my lap and he gave me a huge hug. And he said, mommy, I remember that. He said, I remember the window wipers and the tires. And I came down out of the clouds. And when I knew you were okay, I, and, and he went, he said, I came down in the clouds. I went like this and I saved you. And then when I knew you were okay, he said he climbed back up the ladder into the clouds. And it was so matter of fact. And so like in front of all of us, and we were both, didn't, nobody knew what to say. Wow. And it was so profound and beautiful. And great things can happen from things that we, you know, we might think of being awful. And, and many great things have happened to me since this car accident although I had many years of recovery and mm. it was very difficult, but the things that were so good that came out of it were remarkable. And uh, one of them really was about my understanding of water because on my, I'll just, um, I'll just see what the next, oh yeah, that's an interesting one. So the, um, so when I had the surgery, my last surgery, the doctors said to me, you know, um, you didn't recover well and you've got showers of blood clots in your lungs. And I went mm. in for bowel surgery and they wanted me to take warfarin, which is a blood thinner. Yeah. As I'm sure. You know. Yeah. And, um, and so I was very reluctant because, you know, I, I've, I've always been very holistic ever since I was a little girl. And so I'm like, okay. And so I did it for a few months and then 
they found no clots left in my lungs and they couldn't identify why exactly it had happened either but they were wanting me to continue to take it and I think we should have a choice as to what we choose mm -hmm. to do with our own bodies and I made a choice of which um, it was mine and I decided that I would do everything I could to heal my body naturally and so I stopped taking it and I spoke to a doctor friend of mine who also practices Ayurvedic medicine. And he said, look, totally off the record, if you find a natural source of naturally alkaline water, emphasis on natural, not mm. ionized. He said, this may help to stabilize your body. Um, so I thought, oh, that's, that's easy, you know, just drinking water. And it's <laughs> like, there's lots of natural alkaline water in New Zealand. So I, I did, I put myself on two week trials and I didn't change my skincare or diet or any of those things. And so I started to just drink more alkaline water. And um, no, I mean, you feel kind of like hydrated, but nothing specifically amazing happened. But that's the difficult part, isn't it? We're kind of right. in this deep suit and what are we, we can't see what's really going on. Right. So I had a wellness center and a, a client said, I know this old guy, he's got his own private natural water source with an of an aquifer and the ph out of the grounds 9.9 .9. so maybe you want to try it that's extremely high and i'm like oh absolutely and he was only giving it to cancer patients and so he gave me a month's worth to try i brought it home and within three days of drinking it and this was only a liter in the morning and a liter in the evening on either side of food if you're going to drink alkaline water you don't want to drink it right with, that's what I tell right? people yeah. Need space yeah yeah and so um so you know not huge amount of water but but significant and I noticed on day three a, a real change in something so many people don't really openly want to talk about but I think it really is this indicator of your internal health which is bowel motions and so so many people are like sitting on the toilet for an hour just trying to push a little pebble out and you know there's some serious issues there which mm -hmm. usually involve dehydration yes You're not drinking quality water rather than just quantity and so um I'm like oh well that's that's a nice change given <laughs> that I'd had so much bowel surgery and then on day 10 and 12, I noticed something really weird happening. I had all these bumps coming up along my arm and jaw that was super painful. And I was curious because I could see my body was purging, but I really didn't mm. know what, what or why. I kind of figured the why was because of the water, um, but I, I, I really didn't know what was going on. So it, one was particularly angry and as gross as it sounds, I got some tweezers and I'm like, I feels like there's something yeah. in there. So I pulled this thing out and it's like this um green shard of glass and over the course of those two days I pulled 27 pieces of green glass out of my arm and jaw and I'm like oh my god this is amazing and gross at the same time and the glass was green because this was the side of my body that um that got most of the brunt of a certain of this particular glass in the car the guy who had died he had a um, nightclub in the back of the car were crates of Steinlager beer which are uh, in green bottles and and when we rolled that side of um, this side of my body got more of that green glass and the other side got more of the windscreen and so then I'm like well it's been nearly, you know, just 20 years. How is this even possible that the glass has been in my body that long? Wow. Like, and, and so I, I knew it had to be the water. And then I'm like, well, I wonder if it will heal other people like it, it's doing with me. So I, I had lots of people at the wellness center. And we are, one of the overall things we noticed was that because um, I did gave it to people and did eight week trials on them. And I did it as, as much of like a, a study as I possibly could. Um, we noticed people, um, everybody's eyesight improved. Mm. We noticed that skin issues improved, skin texture improved. Um, people were losing weight that needed to. Um, we noticed um, that even the top athletes were having that incremental little bit more extra energy 
um, someone did a 27 day water fast who had stage four cancer and uh, two weeks after having finished the fast, they couldn't find cancer in his body anymore. He was the fourth person that had had a, done a, a long fast with that water and seen significant change in his health in that particular arena. He also was doing all the internal work. We can't just say it was one factor, but it was one of them. Um, so there was this great big you know, list of people and depression too, really helped people who were having issues as well as fertility. Wow. A couple of, it was over the course of the two years I did it, two people who had done various rounds of IVF and pretty much almost given up got pregnant whilst drinking this water. Now I have no access to the water anymore. The man sold his property, so I can't help anyone in that area. But I do think there are different medicine waters around the world. And more and more and more have come to understand that if a number of a number of things, but the the way you receive whatever water you've got is the way it will respond in your body. And so you could have the best water in the world, but a bad attitude or, you know, just an, uh, just not even being aware or conscious that water is entering you. And it's like ignoring the water completely, which is often the worst, you know, if you, you either send it love or you kind of give it the attention of dislike or, you know, hate you might use that word or you ignore something they've seen in children that attention can be seen one way or another but the ignoring of a child just to ignore them is is the worst same with emoto's rice tests the one that was ignored like rotted the quickest wow. so um, it's interesting about that so within that aspect i think that's something to kind of be aware of um so you know, we're looking at all of this and then and then you kind of go, okay, um, I see that this water is, is helping a lot of people. I see that all these things, but, but, but then, you know, I did studies where I've spat into a dish because I've done lots of bodily fluids. I've done lots of things relative to water. I think I've seen the one of breast milk that you did. That one was fascinating because I'm beautiful. breastfeeding right now. And I'm like, wow, that's just amazing. Well, I mean, I would highly recommend if you're interested to get a petri glass Petri dish and then just put some directly yeah. to the dish and, and, and freeze it for about 10 minutes or 12 minutes, a very, very thin layer you know, enough so that there's some light will come through yeah. and you should be able to see some of those flower-like patterns that form in breast milk, which are just gorgeous. Wow. Um, but by spitting, you get to have, see what information there is specific to your language, your words. Oh. And so where I've spit into the dish, it, there seem to be um, on the bubbles that form um, images relative to your last word. So, for example, one of them was where I was talking about the number eight. And so I, I, I basically was talking about the number eight. I spat into the dish. And afterwards, it was like the number eight had been literally stamped into one of the bubbles. And, if, and we, earlier, I talked about how Jerry had suggested I do the, you know, um, questionnaire where I asked people, what does this look like? And I said that three, three of those images where a hundred percent of people recognize the image, one of them was that number eight. So it, it's really quite remarkable, but it suggests that the, your, the last word you speak has a resonance. Mm. And so it, it's very important. Then you can kind of see this wonderful overlay into what you speak before you eat or drink, the idea of prayer or blessing or gratitude before eating or drinking. And, and what I mean by saying water behaves really relative to how it's received in the body. Mm. So if you're mindful of your last word and that last word is something of gratitude, then the, and you're mindful, okay, something is entering me. You know, right. this is something we don't think about no, because we just, just put food in. And yeah. in but, you know, if we have an apple and then we eat the apple, is it still an apple? 
was you could say well it's become a function of my body and stuff well it's also become you if you look at it like that your your body is using it as energy yes but part of that energy is part of you and so how you receive that is how it's going and you'll see there's been some studies that if you're sitting calmly and you have said some kind of blessing or prayer or something where you're grateful and you sit and you calmly eat you know you won't get so much indigestion you won't feel Mm -hmm. so bloated all of these kinds of things and um and so you know a lot of ancient wisdom is very true Mm -hmm. and it's starting to be seen and the more you study in these realms of um of water and fluids and so that's very interesting because saliva has so much information about you so when you kiss someone for example you might have been on the fence about someone for a while and be like well you know they seem nice but I don't know if I really want to go there and all that chemical stuff there's you just don't know until you kiss someone and then there is an exchange of saliva and your body is so sophisticated in its intelligence that it reads their saliva and reads everything chemically and kind of um hormonally and various things about that person and then there is some information that just leads to your intuition about that person about where you want to take it so that kiss is going to tell you way more than just all the words that might come out mm-hmm. of something that's so and true that's very interesting so um so you know we have these intelligent fluids within us so I think that, um, and and then I know you may well want to talk about um, what the best kind of waters are or maybe about what works to restructure the water and these things. So many people always want to talk about that. So I'm happy to touch on it. 